only mode. Hello and good morning. How's everybody doing today? This is Rich Harshaw here for our, well, our, I guess, quarterly book review. This is a this is a uh, webinar sequence that we did in, I think, 2009 or 10. It's been a while. And then uh, we got away from it for a little while, stuck more to our core, um, our core uh, strategic, tactical, and innovation webinars, and of course our Tuesday morning ad clinics. But uh, I have wanted to get back to this. There's enough good books out there that uh, I'd like to introduce you to some of them. Uh, the purpose of this webinar, this call, is not to be comprehensive in the review of the book. In fact, as you'll see today on this review, we're going to cover a couple of the topics in a lot of detail. We're going to skim uh, a couple of the concepts in very minor detail. So it's not meant to be comprehensive, but I do want to introduce you to <clears throat> some good books out there. In fact, uh, I think there's probably about uh, maybe six or eight really good marketing books out there. I'll give you a quick list if you want to just jot them down. Uh, and this is not in any particular order, but the books that I recommend, and we'll be creating a section of our website soon that'll uh, have these books along with some of the webinars that we end up doing for them. But some of the books that you may want to check into are number one, um, Influence by Robert Cialdini. Influence has a subtitle, which is The Psychology of Persuasion, Influenced by Robert Cialdini. And uh, just Google this stuff. I mean, it's easy to find. It, you, you know, how do you spell Robert Cialdini and all that kind of stuff? Just Google it. Influence the, the psychology of persuasion or go to Amazon and uh, use their search tool. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the next book that I recommend is called uh, My Life in Advertising by Claude Hopkins. Number three is called The Plain English Approach to Business Writing. Plain English Approach to, Biz to Business Writing by Edward Bailey. The fourth one that I recommend is called Secrets of Power Negotiation. Secrets of Power Negotiation by Roger Dawson. And uh, I've actually reviewed that book before, uh, as well as some of these other ones. And then number five uh, is Made to Stick, the one that we're going to talk about today. Now, that doesn't mean those are the only books that I ever recommend, but these are some of the better ones. Uh, I, I'm not a huge fan of reading tons and tons of books because the, the advice starts to get overlapping and it starts to be contradictory, and then you have to you know, kind of pick and choose, which is good, and there's, there's value in that process. But there's not that much information that you really need to know, and it's not been canonized in any way that I, I'm um, familiar with. So these are some of the basic books, and you start getting into more than this. Uh, there's a bunch of books out there by Dan Kennedy. They're heavily focused on copywriting. They're pretty good, uh, but you could probably live without them. There's some decent books by Seth Godin. Uh, not a huge fan. I think that uh, he takes his anecdotes and his analogies a little bit too far to try to make points that uh, you know are, are okay. So maybe you can make your own judgment on those. But today we're going to cover Made to Stick. This is a, a nifty little book I picked up, I don't know, maybe four or five years ago, whenever it was new, and uh, immediately found some concepts in it that were interesting. It's one of those books that's easy to read. It's full of stories. It's full of examples. And uh, you don't get bogged down by a bunch of techno, techno, technological mumbo-jumbo that is difficult to understand. That is uh, also true of the other books that I've recommended. These are all easy-to-read books that aren't particular, particularly technical, but uh, full of a bunch of principles. Okay, And you'll recognize from the MYM lexicon some of the concepts that were pulled out of Made to Stick, particularly uh, one that we'll talk about early on in this webinar, which is the uh, curse of knowledge. It's an idea that came from uh, from this book. So with that being said, just a little bit of a brief intro there. Let's jump into Made to Stick, why some ideas survive and others die. Made to Stick uh, may be worth picking up. So let's start here. This is the concept that they start the book with. Everyone at the movies loves to get popcorn. And uh, there is a group called the CSPI. Center for something, something, something. I can't actually remember what it is. It's a government entity or some kind of government watchdog group, I guess. Uh, not necessarily a government entity. Anyway, um, 
they decided in 1994 that they wanted to attack movie popcorn. In those days, if you may remember this, popcorn was heavily, uh, in most cases, it was made with uh, coconut oil. Now, the, the good thing about coconut oil is that it makes your popcorn taste delicious. The bad thing about coconut oil is that it makes your popcorn not necessarily all that healthy. And this is what they were trying to uh, alert people to. So here's what you need to think through. And this is the uh, thought exercise that they give in the book. If you were this entity, CSPI, and you were trying to get people to pay attention to the fact that popcorn was unhealthy, how would you go about doing that? Well, let's look at some of the uh, facts. One of the facts is that uh, under normal conditions, the USDA recommends 20 grams of saturated fat each day, and according to the lab results by the Center for Science in the Public Interest, that's what this is, SCSPI, Center for Science in the Public Interest, they had um, laboratories analyze popcorn and found that the typical bag of popcorn had 37 grams of fat. Okay, so how do you take this out there to the marketplace and get people to pay attention to it? Now, the idea here is not that you have to agree that this is bad or that this is life-changing or anything like that. It's You have to put yourself in the shoes of the organization called the CSPI, and you have to answer the question, how do I get people to pay attention to this idea that we're trying to promote? Now, the whole idea of having this webinar and talking about this book and going through these exercises in the first place obviously is you've got ideas that you want to get out into the marketplace that you want people to understand, pay attention to, and ultimately, as the book title would suggest, stick, right? So keep, keep in mind the whole idea of what we're trying to do here. You've got a message that you want to stick. Uh, in this example, the CSPI had a message they want to stick. So uh, let's look at some ways that we could do this. Well, we could put a bar chart that shows one of the bars with 20 grams of fat, the USDA. We could show the other one with 37 grams, almost twice as much, and this would graphically show that maybe uh, there's too much fat in this popcorn. Maybe they could have come out and told some kind of a joke because that's what people tell you to do. You know, you got to pass the joke. You know, got to tell a joke when you're trying to get people's attention. Here's what they did. They held a press conference on September 27th, 1992, and here's what they said. A medium-sized butter popcorn at a typical neighborhood movie theater contains more artery-clogging fat than a bacon and eggs breakfast, a Big Mac and fries for lunch, and a steak dinner with all the trimmings combined. And then they pulled out the visuals. They laid out a full buffet of greasy food for the television camera. So they showed the bacon and egg breakfast. They showed the Big Mac and fries for lunch. They showed the steak dinner with all the trimmings. And they said, every time you go to the movies and eat a medium popcorn, here's how much fat you're getting. And this created a sensation all over the news. CBS, NBC, ABC, CNN, it made the front page of the USA Today, the Los Angeles Times, the Washington Post. Jay Leno and David Letterman, of course, took this. One of the main headlines that came out is what you see on the screen right here, which is popcorn gets an R rating. Uh, so this really made a big difference. And here's what happened. The sale of popcorn at movie theaters immediately fell by, what was it, 90 percent, something like that. People refused to eat it. I don't know if you remember this or not. This was uh, 20 years ago. I remember this vaguely. I do remember this big stink about uh, about uh, popcorn and people quit eating it. And they influenced the movie industry to change the oil from coconut oil to something else. And they started posting signs, you know, we use the healthy, uh, the healthy kind of uh, oil and it really made a difference. Now, again, I need you to step back for a second and think about what we're trying to accomplish by reading this book, by going through this webinar. We're trying to take your situation as a business owner who's trying to market your products or services, and we're trying to market things in a way that makes people pay attention, that gets ideas to stick. Now, what you're going to see is a lot of overlap with the MYM principles. 
obviously MYM is designed to get ideas to stick. So this is just a different way to look at some of those kinds of principles, okay? So we talked about the curse of knowledge in MYM. The more you know, the worse off you are. It's difficult to know what it's like to not possess knowledge. Your communication tends to incorporate your more complete understanding of a topic. Uh, I've told the story before. I'll tell it again just uh, for those of you who haven't been at a seminar recently. I uh, had an interesting scenario. My son, who has just turned 12, when he was uh, five years old, so this is going back several years, uh, his grandmother, my mom, took him and a couple of his brothers and sisters, my kids, to the park to play one day. Just wanted to take him out to have some fun. So they went out to the park. And this kid is five years old. He comes up to Grandma while they're playing at the park, and he says, Grandma, I have to go to the bathroom. And she says, okay, and looks around and doesn't see any bathrooms nearby and says, y you know what, there's, there's no bathrooms available. You're, you're just going to have to hold it. They weren't ready to leave yet. She said, you're going to have to hold it. And he said, but Grandma, I have to go really, really bad. And she looked around again, and she thought, okay, you know, we don't want to have to leave. So she looked over in the distance, not that far, and she said, look, over there's some trees. Why don't you just go over there and go behind the tree? And he looked a little bit confused and thought, geez, I, you know, I've never been told to pee outside before. So he ran over behind the tree, and Grandma kept watching the other kids and, you know, was kind of keeping one eye over by the trees and on one, another eye on the kids. A minute later, the kid comes out. He's five years old. He's got his pants around his ankle, and he, and he says, hey, Grandma, Grandma. There's no toilet paper over here. And Grandma about had a heart attack. Okay, so here's what we've got going here. We've got a different, um, we've got a different meaning to the phrase "go to the bathroom" from a 65-year-old grandma to a five-year-old grandson. And I'm going to introduce a phrase to you a little bit later. I'm going to preview it right now. It's, an, it's a phrase called schema. A schema is a definition of, of what something means. I'll, I'll go to it, into it in more detail, but just for now, in the context of that sentence, let's take this. The, the five-year-old schema of what it means to go to the bathroom behind a tree and the 65-year-old grandma's uh, schema of what it means to go to the bathroom behind a tree were to two totally different things, okay? Uh, you see on the slide right now also it says guns. And this is an interesting story that comes from uh, about 1994, I, I had a, a unique opportunity to be a jury member on a murder trial, which is kind of an interesting thing. You see, you see this kind of thing on TV and in movies all the time, and I actually got chosen to be the juror on this murder trial. And it was a very uh, sad situation. Obviously, it was a murder trial, and the, uh, the circumstances of the murder were that it was an inner city type of a of a shooting where a drug deal apparently of some type, some type had gone bad and two cars that had pulled up next to each other apparently to exchange drugs and money, uh, one of the cars uh, pulled a sawed-off shotgun out, put it through the window directly into the face of the driver of the other car and pulled the trigger and uh, killed him. And I was on the jury for this murder trial and something very interesting unfolded as this trial unfolded that I want to communicate to you it was a very telling instructive moment for me in this issue called the curse of knowledge because here's what happened so a, a couple of things in background I won't spend a lot of time here but I want you to understand the background first of all there were two witnesses that testified eyewitnesses that were there at the scene in the car where the boy was shot and I say boy because he was uh, no more than uh, 17 years old, something like that. Uh, he, there, was three, there was three people in the front seat of that car. It was a bench seat, and there was three, the driver, a middle passenger, and a passenger side passenger. They were all right next to each other. The kid who was in the middle seat, right next to the guy who was shot and killed, his buddy testified in the trial as an eyewitness and fingered the shooter as the one who did it. There was also a car that had stopped behind the two vehicles where the shooting uh, incident occurred that was just a, uh, uh, what do you call it, just happened to be there. They weren't related to the parties in, either, in any way, but she just happened to see this, and so she testified that she saw this happen, she saw the gun, she saw the shooter, and it indeed was this defendant. Well, to me, this seemed like a very open and shut case. It was clear that the guy had done it. It was clear that this was a guilty person. So we went into the uh, juror room, and we did our little vote like you do, 
I don't know if you've ever been on a jury before, but you go in and you do a secret ballot vote. And uh, I thought this was going to be an in and out. We'll be finished by lunchtime. But I was shocked that the initial vote, I figured it might be 10 or 11 out of 12 saying guilty, but it was actually 9 to 3 said it was not guilty. I was one of the three said guilty. Nine people heard the same evidence that I did, and they said it was not guilty. Well, so we got to deliberating. I was very uh, shocked and interested to know, well, how did they come up with a conclusion that was not guilty? Well, it turns out that these nine people were looking for all kinds of potential holes in the story, and one of the major ones that they brought out, one of the, the person who actually was the jury foreperson, it was a woman, so I don't think you call it a foreman, but the forewoman, whatever you call it, she had this comment to say. She said, how do we know that it was actually the uh, kid in the car that shot the, the victim? How do we know that? How do we know that it maybe wasn't somebody from across the street who was behind a tree that had a gun and pulled the trigger? And I heard this absolutely dumbfounded, and I asked her and the other jurors, I said, do you know the difference? between a rifle and a shotgun. And they kind of shook their heads and said, well, no, not really. I said, well, let me explain it to you. This kid was shot per the testimony of the district attorney and the forensic, excuse me, the ballistics expert that was brought in by a shotgun. We saw, we looked at as jurors photographs of the shooting injury, okay? And it was graphic. It was not, it was not pleasant to look at. But if you know anything about a shotgun blast, shotguns are packed with what's called a shot, okay, buckshot or birdshot. It's little pellets inside of a cartridge that when it's shot, the pellets come out and spread out. And the idea is if you're trying to shoot something like a bird, it's very difficult to shoot a single bullet at a bird. But if you can shoot these pellets that spread out as they uh, go through the air, then you've got a better chance because it covers a wider area. Well, here's... Here's what you need to know about a shotgun. It's got anywhere between 100 and maybe three or 400 pellets in it, depending on the type of cartridge it is. Let's say a couple hundred pellets. And the further out they go from the shotgun barrel, the wider the pattern of the shot gets. So the idea that somebody from across the street could have shot this person is putting into the – here's where that comes from, this word again, schema. When people hear the word, a kid was shot, if their schema has something to do with maybe think about when John F. Kennedy was shot. We've all seen that footage a, a quadrillion times, and there was a guy up in the uh, book depository, and he had an angle at the president, and maybe there was somebody on a grassy knoll and all these conspiracy theories. But here's the point. Somebody from a distance was able to take a shot and hit the guy. Well, if you look at the injury that the president sustained, it was a single shot. It was a bullet. Much like a handgun has a bullet, a rifle is a longer barrel version of a handgun, essentially, that shoots a single bullet, and it's intended to be a very precise shot, something that you might shoot larger game like maybe a deer with. Shotgun, on the other hand, shoots a pattern. Well, here's the point of this whole story before I wear this story out and get you uninterested by telling stupid, boring stories. It was real simple. The prosecuting attorney, the district attorney, assumed that the jury understood the difference between a rifle and a shotgun, did not think to make that distinction. Because why? Because the prosecuting attorney and the ballistics expert, for that matter, were so familiar with this concept, the difference between a rifle and a shotgun, that it didn't even dawn on them that other people might not know the difference, and therefore it led to confusion. How do we know that this person was shot at close range? Well, the evidence actually very solidly supported that it was a point-blank, sawed-off shotgun blast, but the people didn't know that. Okay, So here's what we've got to do. We've got to communicate things in marketing in a way that is extraordinarily concise, extraordinarily specific, extraordinarily concrete, that allows people who do not know anything about what's being introduced to quickly understand it, okay? So the curse of knowledge is what we want to get past. The goal is to create powerful ideas that stick. So think about this as a, as a uh, goal. What if somebody were to state this? 
Our goal is to become the international leader in the space industry through maximum team-centered innovation and strategically targeted aerospace initiatives. Well, this is extraordinarily difficult to understand what in the heck it means because it uses a bunch of big words like you would probably find on the SAT test, and it really doesn't say anything. What if instead, in 1961, the President of the United States were to say the following? Our goal is to put a man on the moon and return him safely by the end of the decade. And this is indeed what John F. Kennedy said in 1961. Wow, that's two Kennedy references in five minutes. I don't think I've ever made even one before, but there was two. But uh, this was the, uh, the audacious statement in 1961 that was able to successfully rally the entire country to this goal. Now, there was a lot of emotion. There was a lot of you know, factors that played into this goal, but to communicate it powerfully is something that made this idea stick. It became a rallying call for an entire nation, for an entire decade. That's pretty powerful, okay? And that's what we're trying to go after here. So there's six principles of stickiness in the book. The first one is simplicity. Next is unexpected. And this is where we're going to spend the majority of the time that we have together today is on these two concepts, simple and unexpected. Uh, there's four additional concepts. One is concreteness, credibility, emotional, and then stories. And uh, I'm going to spend very little time on concrete, credible, and emotional. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on story, but we're going to spend the majority of the time on the first two. And uh, because I think they're where uh, we can take the most value out of this book. Okay? So let's start with simple. And we're all familiar with. Um, Southwest Airlines, if you looked at them and said, what is their core value? And this is what I want you to think about in, in your business. What is your core value? And Southwest's core value is that they are the low fare airline. Okay? Now, let's think about this for a minute. First of all, why is it important that they have this idea that they are the low fare airline? What's so critical about this? Well, because it allows customers to know that, hey, if you want a cheap flight, you're going to get it from Southwest. But here's the other thing. It also allows everybody involved to understand how to make decisions based on the information given. Okay? Now, low fares is not the only diagram given by – excuse me, diagram – not the only core principle given by Southwest Airlines. They've got other core principles as well. For instance, one of – Southwest Airlines' core principles, besides being the low fare airline, is that they are also a fun airline. But here's what happens. They put a hierarchy of core elements, and it allows them to make decisions. So let me give you an example. I mentioned this on the Tuesday morning ad clinic the other day. If you happen to be tuned into that, you heard me preview this example, and I'm going to give it to you right now. If Southwest Airlines says that they are the low fare airline, and then they've got another concept that says we are the fun airline. It aids in decision making. So, for instance, if a flight attendant decides it's another flight attendant's birthday and we want to have some fun with that, is it okay to have fun with the flight attendant's birthday if you're an employee of Southwest Airlines? And the answer is, well, number one, we're the low fare airline. Number two, we're the fun airline. So it fits in with – we're the fun airline, but now let's look at different ways to have some fun with it. What if they decided they wanted to sing happy birthday or to make a joke or to say something or to otherwise embarrass the flight attendant over the intercom so that all the passengers could say something or do something uh, and have some sort of participation in this birthday? Would that be okay? Well, would that jeopardize, number one, the low fare airline? And the answer is no, it actually wouldn't have any impact on that at all. What about number two, the fun airline? Well, yeah, that would be fine. Now, what if they decided that they wanted to have a little party and bring out some cakes and throw some confetti? Is this fun? Yes. Is it consistent with their number one core principle, which is the low fare airline? And the answer is no, it's not. And here's why, because cakes cost money, they create messes that need to be cleaned up, which costs money. Confetti has to be cleaned up by somebody, which costs money. So it jeopardizes the number one core value. Now, here's why I'm telling you this. <clears throat> if you've got a hierarchy 
of core values for your business, it allows you and your employees and your customers to make decisions because it's obvious and clear what is important. Now, here's the problem that most businesses have. They, they do not have a core statement or core understanding of what it is they do. What they do is they say, well, we're here and we're awesome and we're really good. And there's a lack of specificity, there's a lack of concreteness, there's a lack of simplicity, and they tar start to struggle, okay? So let's take a look at something called, well, how to write. So we're going to look at two things. One is the five-part essay. And if you were to write a five-part essay, these are the five uh, parts. The introduction, narration, affirmation, negotiation, and the conclusion. Well, that's good. But what if you're writing for a newspaper? Can you use this style? And the answer is, well, it kind of depends on what you're writing. If you're write, writing a feature article, then maybe you can write this. But what if you're writing a news article? And here's what you find. News articles are not written like this on the left side of your screen at all. They're written using what's called the inverted pyramid. Okay? On the inverted pyramid, the conclusion goes first then essential information, then important information, then supplemental information, and then data tables or any other kind of information that may help to support the conclusion. Now, why is this? Why is it that in journalistic writing, you put the conclusion first? And the answer is, because if you understand that the way that a newspaper is run, you understand that there is a very tight premium on printed space. Now this could go for TV or radio news as well, but let's just think in terms of a printed newspaper. There's a premium on space. So let's say that you have written an article and it's, uh, let's say, 800 words long. That's a pretty long article. And the editor comes in at the last minute and says, hey, you know what, we just had uh, some breaking news that we need to put into the newspaper. We're going to have to eliminate some things because we've already got uh, you know, a set amount of space for this edition of the paper, we need to eliminate some space. Well, here's what they do. Well, first of all, let me tell you what they don't do. What they don't do is go in and take the articles that were written already and edit them for length by going back and, and doing a full edit job. What they do is they simply go to the bottom of the article and they start lopping off paragraphs. Literally, this is how it works. This isn't like a made up, uh, you know, oversimplistic thing. This is actually how it works. If they take an 800-word 800 800 article and they run out of space because something more important or something urgent came in, what they're going to do is they're going to evaluate how much space do we have, and if it's 600 words, they're going to cut the last 200 words off of that thing. If they've only got 400 words, they're going to cut the last 400 words off of it. If they've only got room for 200 words, they're going to lop off 600 words worth of information. And if your conclusion was at the end, guess what? <laughs> it really doesn't work at all okay so this is how we want to write and think in terms of marketing and in terms of of uh, writing advertising and things like that okay so think about this first of all what is your core value what are your supplemental core values for instance again to use the example for Southwest Airlines number one the low fare airline, number two, fun, okay? Number three, which you might uh, uh, be aware of, is that they are not a nickel and diming airline. They don't nickel and dime you all the time. You know, bags fly free, right? This is a very simple concept. Bags fly free. Well, how much do bags cost at other airlines? No change fees. No change fees. What about other airlines? It's easy to understand, okay? So here's what I want you to think of. What are your core principles? Now, at Monopolize Your Marketplace, we use a concept called identity. You're probably familiar with this. And this is all we're trying to do when we create an identity. We interview you. We find out what's important and relevant, what you're good at, what you do, what you stand for. And we distill it out of an hour and a half worth of conversation into a couple of key principles that can be communicated. And then we go to work on finding interesting simple, powerful, concrete, emotional ways to, to tell that story. Okay, That's really all we're doing. 
So I want you to think in terms of simplicity. If you can't tell me in a couple of sentences what it is that you're all about, you're going to fail. You say, well, what do you mean I'm going to fail? I'm going to fail in business? I'm not going to fail in business. Obviously, I'm still in business. You're going to fail to reach your potential is what you're going to fail to do. Okay? There's an old saying that says, if you say three things, you don't say anything. This is why in marketing, I very frequently caution you against putting more than one major idea into an advertisement. Now, there's exceptions to that, and this is not an ironclad kind of thing, and I'm not saying that under any circumstance you should never have you know, a second or third idea. Here's what I'm saying is that in most cases, particularly in a multi-touch environment, we want to communicate one thing loud and clear so that people hear it and understand it. Okay, maybe you remember this from the 1992 election. It's the economy, stupid. And this is back when Bill Clinton was running for office and he was battling against uh, Ross Perot, who was talking about the national deficit, and that would be, had become a very big sticking point. Well, uh, Clinton's advisor, James Carville, had gone into a meeting with the staffers of the campaign, uh, the people managing the campaign, and they started writing out simple ideas, and this is the one that stuck. It's the economy, stupid. Here's what we find. Uncertainty paralyzes. Core messages help people avoid bad choices by reminding them what is important. So what we want to do uh, is find ways to encapsulate something. Now, it doesn't have to be very, very short. That's not the principle at play here. Here's the principle is identifying the core value so that we can incorporate it into the core message, okay? Let's talk about an example of a newspaper in Dunn, North Carolina. They have a newspaper there called the Dunn Daily Record that has a 112% penetration. Now, here's what 112% penetration means. That means that more people buy the paper than live in the town. They sell 112 copies for every 100 potential readers. How is that possible? Well, it's extraordinarily successful, and in an interview with the editor, he says, our success is attributable to three things. Names, names, names. That's it, names. Now, this is my little collage of names. It's not those specific names, but their philosophy is that people read the local paper to read about local people. And he was famously quoted as saying, if an atomic bomb fell, fell in rally, it's not news here unless the fallout lands on our town. Names, names, names. Now, think about this as a core concept. If you're a writer for this paper, if you work for this paper, if you are anyhow employed with this paper, and you've got to make a decision about what to put in the paper, what are you going to put in the paper? He also famously said that if they had enough space in the paper, he was exaggerating to make a point, we would print the phone book and people would read our paper just to see if their name was included. And the idea here is very simple. The core concept is this. We put names of local people in the local paper. Now, just to check this, I went to their website today and I pulled up their main stories. And look at the first story. This is not the like on the third page. This is the first story. Now, I, I, there's actually a photo above this, and I cut it off so that you could see more stories. But here's what it is. Natalie, a lesson of love. And this is a special needs child at Lillington Shaw, Shawtown Elementary. Now, how many people do you think in that town are familiar with that elementary? Natalie had an accident. She was disabled, you know, and so she's learned. Benson... Farmer pays back wages for migrant labor violations. J. Roland Wood of Benson, the owner of J. Roland Wood Farms Incorporated, has paid $16,870 in back wages to 138 employees after an investigation by the Department of blah, blah, blah. The department, and I wonder if they name the 138 employees. But there we go, names. That's something that affects 138 people there. Pope Road Bridge should reopen by April. After being struck by a tractor trailer last week, the NC Department of Transportation says that Pope Road Bridge in Dunn at Interstate 95, exit 72, should be repaired and reopened by the end of this month. Next, portions of NC 55 to be closed. So very local, 
lots of names, and uh, this is their philosophy. So let me ask you this. I think this is the key thing. Well, what is your core philosophy? Now, if you were on the Tuesday morning ad clinic with me the other day, we had a good we had a good example of of going through this exercise, and I had somebody on the call, and we were rewriting some ads that they had written, and we talked about this was a, a remodeling company that did uh, windows and siding and things like that, and we talked about do you want to be known as the company that has a great selection? You have multiple types of windows to choose from, or do we want to talk about quality? And we talked about those two overlying core concepts. And this is where this whole idea came up the other day on our on our Tuesday morning ad clinic. And it was an interesting situation. Oh, hang on. Got a little noise coming in here. I need to mute out. Give me just a second. Okay. And it was an interesting situation because it really forced this company to look at what do we want to be? What do we want to be? And I'm telling you, as simple as this sounds, as easy as this sounds, I'm telling you, this is not something that people do. They have a vague idea of what they want to be known for, and they have a hard time communicating it because they don't really know. Okay? Let's go through this uh, this uh, example. It's called the Pomelo Schema. And we're going to get into talking about what a schema is. The Pomelo Schema. Well, here's what a pomelo is. It's the largest citrus fruit. The rind is very thick but soft and easy to peel away. The resulting fruit has a light yellow to coral pink flesh and can vary from juicy to slightly dry and from seductively spicy sweet to tangy and tart. Now, here's the problem with this. It's not very simple. As you try to wrap your brain around what this pomelo is, it's the largest citrus fruit. So we all know what citrus fruits are. So now we've got to try to picture this in our mind. It's, its rind is very thick, but soft and easy to peel away. The resulting fruit has a light yellow to coral flesh. It's juicy. All of this detail starts to kind of throw us off the scent of what this really is. Let me give you a different schema. How about this? A pomelo is basically a supersized grapefruit with a very thick and soft rind. Now, is it easier to understand, based on the second bullet point, what a pomelo is? And the answer is, yeah, because we already have in our mind a schema, a definition, an idea, an understanding of what a grapefruit is, so we can take the word grapefruit, supersize it in our mind, and then we can imagine it having, apparently, a thicker and softer rind Otherwise, they wouldn't have mentioned it. If it was the same, if it was the same type of a rind as a grapefruit, they probably wouldn't have mentioned that. So it's a supersized grapefruit with a very thick and soft rind. Now, here's what we do: we take this schema of something that people already know, and we apply it to something that people don't know. Here's what a scheme is: it's a concept that you already know. Okay? So here's the conundrum with schemas: it's a slower route to the real truth. Okay. In other words, when you use something that is that is already familiar to people and you compare something that's not familiar to it, you're only going to give them an approximation of what it is, and it's not going to be as as uh, accurate, strictly speaking, as if you took the time to explain it in detail. Now, the the example that's given on here is orbiting planets versus what's called probability clouds. Now, this is a very simplistic. Uh, way that elementary school science teachers use to explain the uh, structure of an atom to, to children. They say, and they show a model that says an atom is like a, a planetary system and the electrons orbit around the uh, nucleus. And the kids look at that and they go, oh, okay, I get it. And they understand because they can understand based on their exposure and their existing schema of a solar system, what it's like to have planets that are that are circulating around the center sun. Well, the reality is it's not true. There's really something called a probability cloud, which is a more accurate way to describe the way that electrons behave in reaction in in, in uh, conjunction with the atom. Well, here's what the conundrum is: Do we want to be more accurate and have 
children understand that it's not exactly like an orbiting planet, or do we want to give them something that they can grasp onto quickly? And the answer is, generally speaking, what we want to do is we want to give people the schema of something that they can understand and then fill in the blanks with the details after they already have accepted it, okay? So do you want to value accuracy first at the expense of accessibility or accessibility first at the expense of accuracy? And generally speaking, we would prefer to value accessibility first and then accuracy potentially later. So to give you an example, what about Southwest? They are the low fare airline, right? So why don't they just eliminate aircraft maintenance, right? Well, strictly speaking, if you were the, the low fare airline and you were doing anything possible to lower your cost, then you would eliminate aircraft maintenance, right? And the answer is no, that's, that's obviously silly. But they do do things to make aircraft maintenance cheaper, like only operating one type of plane that only needs one type of standard parts, which only requires mechanics to have knowledge, uh, specialty knowledge of one type of repair. So they do do things in that regard, but again, here's what we're trying to say. When we say the low fare airline, it doesn't mean at all cost. So you've got to understand the schema is not necessarily absolute, okay? Let's talk about metaphors. Think about <clears throat> Disney. Disney says to their employees, I'm talking about Disney World, Disneyland, et cetera, theme parks. They tell them that we are going to cast you for a role, and you're going to audition for it. It's not an interview for a job. It's an audition for a role. When people are walking around the park, they're on, they're on stage. People visiting Disney are not customers. They're guests. Jobs are performances. Uniforms are costumes. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. Does this make a difference in the way that the park operates, the way that the employees see themselves in this, this uh, scheme of this operation? Does it make a difference to the employees? Does it make a difference to the customers? And the answer is it dramatically, drastically, absolutely does. But here's where we go to. Simple. What is the simple, what is the simple core value that Disney is trying to get its people and therefore its customers or guests, should I say, to understand, which is it is an entertainment experience. It's an entertainment experience. You don't interview for a job, you audition for a role. It's like acting. And if you think as an employee that you're on stage performing in a costume for guests, does that affect the way that you do your job? And I'm telling you, it makes a massive difference. And let's compare it to Six Flags. This is what the Six Flag worker wears. And I know because I go to Six Flags and they wear these bright yellow fluorescent shirts that on the back in Spanish or English, depending on the shirt, says, have a heart, do your part to keep the park clean. They have a, an obnoxious-looking billboard on the back of their obnoxious-looking shirts that tells people, hey, pick up your trash, dummy. That's what they wear. Does this affect the way that they do their jobs relative to their counterpart at Disney? And the answer is, you better freaking believe it. Does this guy feel like he's performing, like he's on stage? Or does he feel like a garbage man? And you say, well, would it really make that big of a difference? Here's what I want to know. I want to know who the genius was over at Six Flags that decided to put a pick up your trash stupid message on the back of the shirt. I, 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 don't, I can't comprehend this. I really have a hard time with this. But I think it's a fantastic example to show what is the simple core value how is it communicated? Who is hearing the communication? Number one, the employees. And number two, the, uh, the, uh, the guests. Okay? So let's move to the next concept here in this, for the interest of time. Unexpected. So the first principle in the book was simple. The second one is unexpected. And uh, I want to show you a little bit of a video here. And we're going to stick with our Southwest Airlines theme. And to do this, uh, I'm going to pause my screen for just a minute here. And I'm going to go to, 
Um, all right. Now, this is the uh, this is the safety briefing at Southwest Airlines, and I'm going to play this for you. And I want you. This is just about a minute and a half long, so watch this. Maybe I'll close to two minutes. about unexpected all right and you will notice unexpected is a major element of what we talk about and do and how we position things in monopolize your marketplace okay let me give you an alternate uh, safety briefing that uh, they'll do on Southwest Airlines. If I could have your attention for a few moments, we would sure love to point out a few of the safety features. If you haven't been in an automobile since 1965, the proper way to fasten the seatbelt is to slide the flat end into the buckle. To unfasten it, lift, it up, lift up the buckle, and it'll, it will release. As the song goes, there may be 50 ways to leave your lover, but there are only six ways to leave this aircraft. Two forward exit doors, two over wing removable exits, two aft doors, etc., etc. So they just take an unexpected approach. Now, You've got to be careful with unexpected. You can't be unexpected and goofy. You've got to be unexpected as it relates to, guess what? Here it comes, the core concepts, okay? Now, we've talked in Monopolize Your Marketplace at length about reticular activating system. It's looking for things that are unusual. So this shouldn't be surprising to you that uh, doing something unusual, saying something unusual is going to be a good way to get attention and make, again, as the webinar today would suggest, make things stick. Things are unexpected when they violate our schemas for something, okay? Schemas are like a guessing machine. They help us predict what will happen and consequently how we should make a decision. Surprise is the emotion that is triggered when our guessing machines fail. When we try to adjust our schemas, we then try to adjust our schemas so they'll work better in the future. Surprise makes us want to find an answer. So if we can turn somebody's schema for something upside down, then it tends to work a lot better. This is why a baby who is talking in his crib about E-Trade has an impact on us because our schema for a baby is not that it talks. So it's unexpected and it's surprising, not to mention cued in, amusing. So what I want to do is show you one more video here. This is for an Enclave van. And uh, again, let me get over to the proper place. And I'm going to show you, this is just a 30-second commercial, but this is an interesting example. So, oh, hold on. Uh, hold on. OK. 
Okay, let's go full screen. And here we go. Introducing the all new Enclave. It's a minivan to the max with features like remote control sliding rear doors, 150 cable channels, a full sky view roof, temperature controlled cup holders, and the six point navigation system. It's the minivan for families on the go. Introducing the all Whoops, didn't mean to run it twice there. Okay, so what do we got going on here? We've got, well, we've got a couple of things. We've got violated schemas. <laughs> Sounds kind of weird to say that. But here's what we've done. We violated the schema for what a car commercial could, should contain and for what happens in a trip around your neighborhood, which is namely that you don't get smashed, T-boned, and you know put into a coma or something like that. So unexpected happens when we violate the schema. Now, here's the problem that companies have in their advertising. They work right into the schemas that people have of certain kinds of things. If you use on a radio commercial what I call announcer voice, then you work right into the schema of what people are expecting. Let me give you a couple examples of this. I hadn't really planned on this, but I will find a couple of examples. I want to show you this. Just listen to this. Give me just a second to find it here. Okay, here's a here's an ad that is not a good ad that works right into the schema of what people think they expect to hear. And when somebody hears something they expect to hear and they think they're they already know it, then they tune out. So here we go. What's the best word to describe your bathroom? Old, outdated ugly perhaps? At Rebath, we make your old bathroom look new again in as little as one day and at a price that fits your budget. Our prices are always fixed and guaranteed in writing before we start. So how do we remodel bathrooms so quickly without compromising quality? Our research team in Phoenix develops and tests Rebath's patented DuraBath SSP wall systems that install right over your bathroom walls. No tear-outs required. All right, hopefully you get the idea. Now, let me compare this to a couple of different ads. Um, well, let me play this one first. The, the sound quality on this is not that good. It was a very uh, low quality file, so I apologize for that. But listen to the content of this. Any idiot can install a roof. It doesn't take a genius to grab a hammer, a bucket of nails, and pound shingles into a house. Any goofball with a pickup truck and a homemade business card could pretty much call himself a roofer. Does it really matter? Of course it does, because roofing, like everything else, can be done the right way or the wrong way. And since your roof might cost $10,000 or more to install, the last thing you want is an idiot fool on your house. If an idiot installs the belt pads improperly, you'll be lucky if your roof lasts half as long as it should. If some goofball messes up the vent your roof will overheat and ruin your shingles in three years instead of 25 if some fool all right so you get the idea there <laughs> we got a little bit of unexpected going on there and uh, well I think I'm gonna stop there I'm gonna show you one other commercial here in a minute but I need to get back over here okay all right, so let's get some principles here. For unexpected to work, it must be used in combination with the core message to reinforce the core message. Otherwise, you get what we call in Monopolize Your Marketplace a false beta, right? That means somebody's interrupted, but they're not engaged because what you interrupted them with was not related to something relevant or important or more specifically to your uh, core message, okay? <clears throat> We will please our customers in a low-cost way. This would be expected to hear from Southwest Airlines. But what if they heard this? We'll be the low-cost airline, even if it means intentionally disregarding some of our customers' preferences. Unexpected, and it gets the point through to the employee. Okay. Common sense is the enemy of sticky. What if Nordstrom says we will gift wrap purchases from Macy's, or we'll refund purchases made elsewhere? And these are the stories that they tell their employees. 
What if 7-Eleven came in and said, we'll iron your shirt for you? Well, here's the problem with that. It's interesting because it's unexpected, but because it doesn't relate what you would expect anything to do with the 7-Eleven, it really is a disconnect. But if Nordstrom says, we'll gift wrap a purchase from Macy's, it's unexpected, but it automatically fits into the revised schema of customer service. Let's go through an example of finding the lead in journalism class. This is an interesting story from the book, and I have got to find it. Here it is. Okay, so let's listen to this real quick. This is from a story from the book from a, a guy named, uh, well, I don't know who he is. Oh, Ef Efron, Nora Efron. She remembers her first day of journalism class. Although the students had no journalism experience, they walked into the class with a sense of what a journalist does. A journalist gets the facts and reports them. To get the facts, you track down the five W's, who, what, where, when, and why. As the students sat in front of their manual typewriters, Efron's teacher announced the first assignment. They would write the lead of a newspaper story. The teacher reeled off the facts. So I'm going to tell you the facts. You pretend like you are the uh, journalist student and you come up with the lead, okay? Kenneth L. Peters, the principal of Beverly Hills High School, announced today, this is their school, okay? Announced today that the entire high school faculty will travel to Sacramento next Thursday for a colloquium in new teaching methods. Among the speakers will be anthropologist Margaret Mead, college president Dr. Robert Maynard Hutchins, and California Governor Edmund Pat Brown. Okay, there was the facts. The budding journalists sat at their typewriters and packed away the first lead of their careers. According to Efron, she and most of the others produced leads that recorded the facts and condensed them into a single sentence. Governor Pat Brown, Margaret Mead, and Robert Maynard Hutchins will address the Beverly Hills High School faculty Thursday in Sacramento, blah, blah, blah. The teacher collected the leads and scanned them rapidly. Then he laid them aside and paused. Finally, he said, everybody missed the lead. The lead of the story is, there will be no school next Thursday. Efron recalls, it was a breathtaking moment. In that instant, I realized that journalism was not about regurgitating the facts, but about figuring out what the point is. It wasn't enough to know who, what, when, and where. You had to understand what it meant and why it mattered. For the rest of the year, she says, every assignment had a secret, hidden point that the students had to figure out in order to produce a good story. And you know what? This is what we do all the time in this marketing company in that we're trying to teach you through webinars like this and others to do, which is to find out what. Let's, recall, let's go back and read this again. It wasn't enough to know the who, what, when, and where. You had to understand what it meant and why it mattered. And I am going to underline that because I didn't. You have to understand what it means and why it matters. Okay, and this is what we're trying to accomplish. Finding the lead in the first day of journalism class. Mysteries create a need for closure. And uh, there's an example in the book about uh, Saturn that I am not going to tell. Okay, and uh, it's just an interesting way to get students engaged in a discussion about the rings of Saturn. Whoops, let's see, where should we go from here? Hold on. Yeah, so we're going to we're going to just about run out of time here. Let me just give you a couple more thoughts on this about the mysteries, okay? So, let's go through just very briefly. I'm going to just mention a couple of things and then we're going to uh, we're going to wrap up here. I told you we we're going to spend a lot of time on the first two principles, principle simplicity and unexpected. And then there's also principles of concreteness. Now, this should be uh, familiar to you as an MYM student, we talk about the need for being granular, specific, concrete is a good word that I've just borrowed from this book. So I won't go into detail on that other than to point it out. Next, credibility, making sure that whoever is saying something it has a credibility level to them. This makes an idea sticky. That's why an organization like the uh, CSPI has a fancy name, so people will believe them. The next one is emotional, and uh, I think that's fairly self-evident that the more emotional it is, the more people will uh, be drawn to it and will be sticky. 
and again, I'm not going to talk in detail about these. I'm going to encourage you to pick up the book and do so yourself. The last one is one that I'm particularly fond of, which is stories, telling stories that make people want to hear the end. And you'll notice that in the MYM teaching methodology, I employ stories a lot because stories make it easy for people to understand concepts, to take a schema for something that they already have and transpose it to something that they're not as familiar with. Uh, I tell stories all the time about things that are familiar to me, my family. I tell lots of stories about my kids, like the one about the kid behind the tree, about trips that we went on and stayed at Holiday Inn Express, and we went to Wall Drug and we saw the signs, and you know all these different stories that help make the point. I told you a story earlier today about a murder trial, and that's fairly unexpected. It's fairly emotional. It's a simple story that makes a point. Okay, so using stories, there's a great example in uh, the book about a story that everybody's familiar with. And it might be worth picking up the book and reading this interesting little story. It's about a, a sandwich franchise called Subway who had launched a, a, uh, an advertising campaign called Seven Under Six. Seven sandwiches under six grams of fat. And what they found was, even though it was interesting, it really wasn't sticking and making much of an impact. Well, then they found this guy named Jared. You ever heard about this guy? <laughs> Of course you have. Jared was 425 pounds, and he decided to put himself on a self-imposed Subway diet, dropped 100 pounds in three months, stuck with the diet for more, several more months, losing as much as a pound a day, began walking, and in April 1999, uh, the local store where he was buying his subs uh, decided to talk to him about, you know, maybe this is something interesting we can put together and it actually made it all the way up through corporate and of course he's become a, uh, a some, somewhat of a cultural icon and uh, everybody knows Jared and I think he's worth something like 80 million dollars now or something and he's still skinny. But the story is emotional, it's simple, it's concrete, it's easy to understand and it has a lot going for it. That's why I uh, constantly am talking to you about finding stories, things that you can say and talk about that many people want to listen and want to hear. That's why on your About Us page of your website, we like to come in there, find out a little bit about you as an individual, make, this, make the company more human, tell how you became the company you are. If you used to be an organic chemist and that has uh, led you to an absolute insistence on things being absolutely precise because in organic chemistry, if experiments aren't precise, things blow up and now you're a remodeler and that makes it so that you want things to be just exactly right, that's an interesting story. And people do want to know this stuff, and they will take the time to read and listen to these kinds of things. So I'm going to leave it there for now. The book is called Made to Stick. It's highly recommended. It's one of my uh, five or six books that I consistently recommend to marketing students. So you may want to pick it up either in hardback. Uh, I've also listened to it on Audible. It makes for a good listen while you're exercising or driving around town or whatever you're doing. So go ahead and pick it up. And... Uh, well, I think that's it for now. We are going to reconvene uh, a week, uh, not next week. Next week is spring break, so I'm going to be off with my kids doing some stuff. But uh, we will be back the following week for a Tuesday morning ad clinic, and I look forward to talking to you then. Thanks so much for participating. We'll talk to you later. Bye now.